Your hosts today are Monique van Dusseldorp, David Matten and Ina Feistritzer, plus very special guest, product designer and strategist Ben Sauer. A very warm welcome to you from Hamburg, London and Amsterdam. Monique van Dusseldorp here, calling in from Amsterdam, or rather from lovely Duventrecht. David Martin here, calling in from London. With him, we take a closer look at how to change design and design change. Why are we interested in this? Because the way we design digital products has a huge impact on the way we live on a small scale, but also for society at large. Those of you who have been following the next program in the past years know that we took a closer look at this from various angles. We had speakers who brought the downside of attention seeking technologies to our attention. We talked about fake news spreaders that threaten our democracies or address the digital divide that is created by the means of digital products. The latter topic came to my attention the other day when colleagues of mine started a discussion about how the pace of digital change is going to leave the poorest unable to catch up behind. The trigger for this discussion discussion was the newly released Corona app here in Germany. In the first 25 hours of its release this week, the app received around 6.4 million downloads according to the Germany's health ministry. However, if you have, let's say, an iPhone older than five years, this is potentially life-saving app does not run on your phone. This is a general problem not inherent to this particular app. Designing for old products is time and money consuming. But what can we do about this to ensure we'll innovate in a way that is more inclusive and sustainable? This is a question of design. And that's why I'm delighted to have Ben Sauer here today. Ben is a product designer and strategist with special knowledge in healthcare and voice design. He reminded us at the next conference last year that it is important to slow down, to speed up. Ben, thank you so much for being our guest today. What topic are you planning to address? Hi, everybody. Well, today I am going to tackle what happens when new technologies emerge and how we apply metaphors to them in times of rapid change, because I think we're obviously going through one of those phases right now and thinking about our analogies and metaphors can really help. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to that. But before we start with your talk, we like to hand over to Monique and David for the picks of the week. Hello. Thank you, Inna. Yes, it's time for review of the week where we share with you the big happenings, the innovations, the digital culture that should be on your radar this week. This week, mainly on my mind, has been augmented reality. And that's because of Snap, the people behind Snapchat. Remember Snapchat? We used to talk about it all the time. The people behind Snapchat had a big event this week, their partner summit. It was a virtual event. Obviously, there wasn't a huge thronging crowd there or anything like that. But at this virtual event, they introduce some products that they've been working on that look super interesting, including local lenses, a kind of online shared uh, augmented reality that you're looking at now that's going to enable people to totally transform the way they experience the physical environment around them. So back in 2019, the iconic technologist Kevin Kelly talked about the mirror world, a kind of one to one augmented reality map of the real physical world around us. And he said that it's going to be the next big platform for digital. So the first big platform was simply the web. The second big platform was social media. Mirror world, says Kevin Kelly, will be the third big platform and it is going to transform digital culture and it's going to be a trillion dollar business and it's pretty clear from this partner summit that snap want to own that mirror world it's a hugely bold play they've kind of been doing it while we've all been looking the other way okay we haven't paid much attention to snapchat recently they've quietly kept their heads down they are building the mirror world they want to be the next trillion dollar company it's extremely interesting but it's not just snapchat that made me think about augmented reality this week tiktok are getting in on it too. 
TikTok is the new kid on the block. TikTok's what we've all been talking about while Snapchat's been beavering away. TikTok are now launching augmented reality lenses and you can go inside there and start experimenting with them. They're pretty primitive right now. They're nothing like, you know, what Snapchat are doing. But still, it's an indication that everyone is interested in this third big platform in augmented reality as the next next big digital platform. There are some pretty fun like workout augmented reality lenses you can use inside TikTok where you have to do a certain number of press ups and keep a ball moving through a maze and stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So check that out. Uh, and the third thing I saw, this Dutch innovator, Baz Gazelle, using, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, Monique can tell me in a minute, um, using augmented reality lenses um, at, at, to enhance Black Lives Matter protests. So it doesn't all have to be about crazy unicorn rainbows. It doesn't have to be about working out. Augmented reality is going to change so much of the way we experience the physical world around us. It's going to lead to all kinds of new shared experiences, including protests, including, you know, getting behind a movement, being inspired to take action. Augmented reality is what was on my mind this week. But what about you, Monique? What was on your mind this week? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you so much for that excellent reminder. Um, well, physical space i think this this whole period where everybody in the whole wide world had to sit at home and only had digital and screens to entertain themselves with um somehow made our longing for physical space i think even bigger now what i've got here is um you know how does the digital get us into the physical space this is 1922 in amsterdam this is actually the street where i used to have an office um it is a tech story in a way because um this video is uh, pretty good. It's actually better than you'd expect. And that's because they are enhancing it with neural networks. They train them on movies and then artificially generate additional frames and the color. You know, they, they make frames that don't really exist and make them a beautiful movie, movie out of it. So that was 1922. Okay, everybody on their bicycles. Let's roll the next asset. Bicycles 2020. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is what a Dutch lockdown looks like. You know, almost nobody in the streets, you know. We're all on our bicycles and we go everywhere. This is a month ago, a month and a half ago. Um, so you think, oh, you know, really nice. And what you see as a result of this crisis that we have now, that actually lots and lots of cities have been announcing bicycle plans. I mean, Milan was one of the first, the center of Brussels, car speeds will be limited to 20 kilometers per hour. So basically that's a residential yard for the center of Brussels. Paris is building a bicycle pathway. Even Lima, Peru is adding loads and loads of bike lanes so there's there's something going on and it's very suddenly and also very ambitiously so it's it's not just one bicycle lane it's lots of them now let's go back to amsterdam actually because the feeling on the whole is like oh you know these dutch people with their lovely traditions and their bicycles and they always talk about it i always am um but let's go to what happened in the 70s can we see the third item yes that's the one i would like to see um because this, this didn't just happen. In the 70s, Amsterdam was a car city. I mean, everybody drove cars. And what happened was two things. So many people got, so many kids got killed in traffic that were protesting saying, uh, stop the child murder. And there was a big oil crisis. So suddenly we had car free Sundays. And it was this moment in time, this crisis, which sort of flipped that whole history and made us design our cities for pedestrians, for bicycles, still can be better but you know this is what happened and is this a tech story well in a way it is because what's happening now and we can roll the last asset here is you know bicycles are now tech property they are tech design um this is a very specific one this is the van move bicycle just a new one was with these beautiful images a car melting into a beautiful bicycle but also the bicycles that you see out in the street here that cross pollinated transport vehicles that combine sort of car and bicycle and electricity and, and you know, internet and everything. So um, that was my thought of the week, Dutch design and bicycles. And now I'll stop. Okay. Where do we go from here? Thank you very much, Monique. Yeah, I'm inspired by that. I mean, can we combine augmented reality and bicycles or is that just going to be dangerous? Oh, well, we can import bicycles into Fortnite. into Fortnite. I mean, you know, the next metaverse, you know. <laughs> Bicycling from one side of the other side of Fortnite? Uh, I think it is time to introduce our star guest, who you, I'm reliably informed, discovered yourself or brought to this programme yourself. Am I right? 
Yes, yes. Before January 2019, Ben Sauer didn't exist. No, he, um, in, in January 2019, he posted a, a few tweets online that I just happened to read because I'm a procrastinator and my favorite procrastination is looking at the social feeds on my, for my network, who are all very smart and intelligent people. Um, and, and he said, you know, slow down to speed up. That's what we need. It wasn't just one tweet. It was a series of 25 tweets with documents and, you know, links and a very interesting thought. We'll post it later on. Um, and I contacted him and he came out to speak in Hamburg and did a brilliant talk. And now he's here. And you now said he's here. Yes. It's a beautiful story. So look, brought to you exclusively by Monique von van Dusseldorf. <laughs> exactly. He's mine. He's mine. <laughs> he calls himself an opportunity detective. He's worked with teams at BBC and Tesco. Amazon uses methods. He's trained people at NASA. He's here to talk to us today about how digital products can serve real people, about voice, about design, about what to design in this moment, how to slow down to speed up and much more. So let's hear from Ben right now. Roll those credits. Hey, everybody. Right. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, often in times of change, when new technologies emerge or indeed crises emerge, we need to create a lot of change. And the metaphors that we use to operate in that change are actually often what defines how we respond. So thinking about all the practical changes that we're going through at the moment. So next slide, please. Some organizations are experiencing so much change in response to the crisis. So, so much of our behaviors have to change, our economics, our work habits have to change. That, for example, some organizations are going through several years of digital transformation and they did it in only a few weeks. It was kind of a forcing function, right? So again, thinking about what metaphors we can apply what is happening right now? Well, we're essentially going through a period of, uh, uh, of experimentation to meet all these changes. What, um, what will emerge out of these changes? So next slide, please. Benedict Evans, he talked um, on his blog a little while ago, and he said, we're going through this vast forced public experiment to find out which bits of human psychology will align with which kinds of tool. So, you know, we have lots of remote work methods, but are we applying them in the right way? Before they were kind of slightly bastard children of the way we work, but now we have to rethink, well, maybe this is the only way I work, so what happens? So I want to talk about this historical mistake that we've made when new technology emerges, and it's called the Tiller problem. Next slide, please. Now, you may not know this, but when the first cars were invented, um, one of the first steering input devices was a tiller, um, as in the steering uh, mechanism from a small boat. And why were they thinking of a tiller as the best device to steer? Well, I guess they were thinking of small vehicles and small boats, and that seemed to work. So, OK. Now, of course, the steering wheel existed on a ship already, but they didn't use the large vehicle metaphor. They used the small vehicle metaphor and applied the tiller and found eventually a few years later that it really wasn't actually very good as a device to steer things. Um, now, you can see this pattern play out a few times uh, in the past 150 odd years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if we take a look at early film, for example, what you'll notice about early film is that it was shot as though the camera was sat in the audience of a theater, right? So you notice the staging, the way the shot is composed is as though you are standing in a theater watching a stage. And indeed, many of them were shot on stages. So why were they doing that? Well, when they were making dramas and they were writing scripts or whatever it was they were doing, they were thinking, oh, this film thing is like theater. Of course, well, it isn't like theater. And it took, it took them several years to discover things like the edit or the close up, right? All the things we take for granted in film today required people to actually throw away their old analogies that they were applying to the technology and think of new ways, new language. The language of film is in, in some ways throwing away the old metaphors. Okay, um, there's one particular set of technologies that's going through a lot of this, very topical given what we uh, talked about earlier. Um, so VR and AR are going through this uh, a lot of the moment. So if we can have the next slide, we can watch a short film of something that Facebook are up to at the moment. So here's a demo of Facebook, um, and this is something they're thinking about for the scenario of work. So you are um, at your desk, and um, you can use a computer in AR or VR just like uh, all the things you use today, right? So pushing buttons, moving screens around. Now, 
there's many fundamental questions about these technologies that, that, that we have to answer, right? So when VR first emerged, people started to say, well, what is it really for? Is it like games? Is it like narrative? It can do both of those things, but not in the same way. I would argue that the language of VR and AR hasn't emerged yet. We haven't immersed our brains in it and designed it properly yet. And what you see here in this concept video, and um, you know, and this is really great work in essence, but it is essentially a replication of what we do in our real lives, right? It's pushing buttons and moving screens around. So we haven't yet broken through some of these paradigms. If we move to the next slide, I think one that we're all feeling in particular at the moment, um, is events and meetings, right? So lots of conference organizers, I'm sure next are thinking about that list a lot themselves. The fact that I'm here, they're thinking about it, is, well, what is a conference if it's purely virtual? Again, there were virtual conferences before, but we kind of didn't necessarily treat them with the same care that we did a real life conference. So what is it that's going on here? Well, for example, one thing that I've seen a lot of conference organizers do recently is sort of try to replicate things like the coffee break in a virtual conference. Well, is that right? I mean, if you think about the social scenario that's going on in a real conference, it's quite subtle what goes on with body language and where people are looking. Um, Doug talked last week about mimesis, which is, uh, you know, being in person, learning from the presence of another person. That's very different to what, let's say, a tool like Zoom can offer you, right? So we have to figure out, yes, there are these new technologies and these new ways of doing things, or in the case of video calls, not that new, but now they're a necessity. We have to really think about how we're going to use them. So if we move forward, um, the danger is when you apply old metaphors, they can sometimes um, hold back your thinking um, when you start thinking about your new technology or your new how your new piece of engineering is going to be turned into a product. But of course, the tricky part is that metaphors and analogies are also need for the, needed for the acceptance of a product. Um, so you might know of this phenomenon that was talked about in the sort of early smartphone era of skewer morphism. If we move to the next slide, I'll show you a quick example of this in our sort of online collaborative space, which is Google Docs. Now, if you think about it, Google Docs was actually replicating the familiarity of a Word document. But you see, still today, even though I would argue probably hardly anybody prints these out, it's still using the metaphor of paper because people needed to feel comfortable with that metaphor in order to, to, to have it replace word. And in fact, this boils down even to the names of products. If we move to the next slide, we can see that um, if we really think about what is the iPhone, right? It isn't actually a phone, it's a portable computing device. Phone is only a very small part of what we use it for, but people needed to accept it as a phone. And Facebook, if you don't know, historically was a directory on a university website in the States. So people needed to know that, hey, all my friends and colleagues at university are on there, but you don't look up phone numbers on Facebook. It's not actually a Facebook. The name Facebook was just a way to get people to accept the transition from something they used to use into a completely new thing. Um, I love this quote, if we move forward, from um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. He said, the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function, right? So if you're creating something or thinking of something new, we have to really separate out, okay, what are the metaphors that I might use that might accidentally hold me back or chain me to old thinking and I want to really be careful about avoiding those. But I also need to be aware that in order to have a new trend or a new product accepted, I might need to apply um, a, a metaphor for people to accept it, right? So, um, you know, sometimes in the company I used to work for, they would say, oh, you're the Uber of healthcare, right? Well, it, we're nothing like, they were nothing like Uber, they still aren't, but people needed to kind of hear something like that in order to accept the change. And in fact, let me highlight something that's going on and being discussed um, a, a lot at the moment with obviously radical change to the healthcare systems. So the company I used to work for, Babylon Health, essentially started out by replicating doctor's appointments in a digital form, right? So in a video call on your phone, you could instantly go and talk to a doctor. Now, that was very useful in terms of consumer acceptance in the UK, where people needed to actually be able to accept, hey, I need a doctor's appointment but I am just happened to be doing it on my phone on a video call. But let's say we stripped out the traditions and the economics of healthcare and said, how would we run a healthcare service from scratch with today's tools? Well, the truth is you probably wouldn't run it based on 10 minute doctor's appointments. You would do more smarter things like you would have different forms of communication with your doctor. 
Um, you would triage people depending on what's wrong with them. And we're only now several years into kind of telehealth, seeing technologies emerge that will actually figure out what the new paradigm is rather than blindly copying something like primary care. Um, and in fact, this is much discussed with products like Ask My GP or um, the scarce resources that doctors are you know, being given at the moment. So um, you can see there that the application of the metaphor of primary care and a doctor's appointment was actually potentially something that needed to happen, but ultimately may have held the space back. Now, my particular field of expertise as well as healthcare is voice. So if we move to the next slide, I wanna talk um, a bit briefly about voice. Um, now, you may not know this, but people have been dreaming about what voice is good for, if we move to the next slide, um, for literally thousands of years. Um, Aristotle said, you know, there's only one condition in which we can imagine managers not needing subordinates and masters not needing slaves. Each instrument could do its own work at the word of command or by intelligent anticipation. So that dream is only, this 2000 plus year old dream of speaking to machines is only now coming true. And I think it's lovely that Aristotle said this because he's kind of the father of computing itself, as in he imagined logic, right? He gave us things like algebra in his thinking. Now, how do we think about the application of voice today? If we move to the next slide, well, we often use fiction to explore what it's good for. This example is from the TV show, The Good Place, Janet, right? So this magical assistant that acts like a personal assistant, almost always female, right? That kind of magically appears and helps you in any moment of your life. And that's what they portray in the TV show. So if you think about voice, it's often portrayed as this magical thing, always accessible. It's remarkably intelligent. It's essentially omniscient. It knows everything. But where are we today? Well, ultimately, although we are trying to do things like this, if you move to the next slide, Google Duplex successfully fooled people into thinking they were having completely authentic uh, conversations with an actual human. The truth is most of our voice technology is not capable of a human level conversation and isn't smart enough yet and may not be for many years. It doesn't look like machine learning and deep learning, these trends will necessarily get us to replicating our own intelligence. I would argue we don't even know how our own intelligence actually works. So how can we possibly argue that we'll get there anytime soon? However, if we look at what we need now from voice, maybe it's a little bit more mundane. I know that Doug talked about this last week, right? Maybe if we stop thinking of the utopias and start thinking about more practical realities, maybe we just need voice right now to help us stop touching things like kiosks, right? That's what we need to do is reduce disease transmission by having people stop pushing the same buttons. Um, I'm always asking this question when I go through customs, right? You know, when, you, when you're touching the buttons or in the States, when you get your fingerprint read, I always wanna know how often are they cleaning that thing? Anyway, and I would argue this even applies to our personal devices, right? Because when I've got my gloves and my mask on and I'm going shopping, I don't actually wanna be touching things. Voice, even though I don't necessarily need a magical assistant in that moment, might be a really, really good way for us to reduce our, our contact with people and, and diseases. So, um, I wanna just round up with a couple of points if we move to the next slide on how you can mind your metaphors when thinking about new technology. So I mentioned the tiller effect. So watch for tillers, avoid blind replication of existing services and things. You need to think really carefully about how the new technology affords you something different. Um, you need to distinguish between internal and external, right? So what are the metaphors you use in your marketing or then even the name of the product versus the ones you're using internally. And then understanding the strengths of a medium like Zoom calls do not capture uh, the subtleties of body language or um, the subtle audio environments that we exist in in the real world in a meeting space. We can pick up a lot more from each other. So we have to actually say, well, what are the strengths and limits of a technology like Zoom and work with them instead of trying to blindly replicate other things? Um, Another point I want to round up on, um, the, the, the thing about um, Apple and the contact tracing apps came up earlier. There's another method which really helps here, which is designing for extremes. Designing for extremes, um, the best example of this is the cordless kettle. You may not know this, but the cordless kettle was designed for people who are elderly or with real um, difficult mobility issues. But it turned out that design was better for essentially everybody, right? With the fact that you don't have to bring a cord with you when you move your kettle around. I would argue that those contact tracing apps should have been designed for extreme. So what's the minimum technology that people carry around with them? Old iPhones, old Android devices work with those because frankly, everybody deserves the right 
to be free of COVID-19. And so that's the way we should be designing. I want to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, we have lots of questions. David, shall I take a few questions? You go for it, Monique. I, I understand the tiller effect. I understand that whenever there's a big change of paradigm, people will start with, you know, using what they knew. Is that avoidable? Do you actually need to do first? Do you, do you need to use the old model to realize what doesn't matter and then move on? Or can you just skip it? I mean, I think it's a learning exercise. Sometimes we see technologies shift very radically and they get the, whoever those creators are get that they can move forward much more quickly. Um, you know, I would argue that, you know, Apple did that very successfully with a smartphone, but it took a few years of stewing on what it meant to have a portable computing device in your hand. Um, one thing that's happening at the moment is you're seeing sort of the nature of local services shift, right? So what does a restaurant offer, right? It, it, it may, lots of restaurant owners may be thinking, I need to offer the same food, but fundamentally what people need from that service may shift. And maybe those food services that can shift their thinking about what fits our new behaviors and our new economic realities, those who can shift into that mode first will be the most successful in the new reality. I mean, I, I've personally been obsessed with online events, obviously, this is my industry, online events. And um, you mentioned also on your Twitter feed, uh, some examples of, you know, what doesn't work. But do you already see after this, you know, compressed period of innovation, which is only three months, examples coming up where you think like, okay, this is a completely new way of thinking about. Um, well, I haven't attended events like that, but I have read um, people who are on the cutting edge of this. I would argue that what they're doing is actually experimentation. They haven't sort of cracked it yet. Um, uh, but um, there's a there's a couple of people in mind. My friend Matt has a blog called Interconnected. He's been looking at the way in which um, different uh, event organizers are trying radically different schedules. Um, yeah. I mean, this is perhaps an example of this, right? Maybe we don't need to be together for the entire day. So um, my colleagues at Clear Left, the design agency I used to work at, have a conference next week where they're trying a completely different schedule. And I would hope that we find lots of new ways in that to socialize. I've seen some real failures, I won't name them, but I've seen a couple of conferences that really tried very hard to do the kind of serendipity thing of meeting people you don't know. And the design just wasn't there. I didn't really feel like talking to anybody when I attended. Um, so I think we're going to see by necessity quite a lot of fast innovation. I haven't seen anything that really, really gets it right yet. Also though, you have to say, can you solve those problems with the new technologies, right? You have to be able to say, maybe we need to solve them by completely different means. And again, not blindly replicate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we're, we're working on things for September that will be Excellent. so exciting. David, you're <laughs> Yeah, well, there's so much in there. I mean, I'm, fa I'm fascinated by this uh, tiller problem phenomenon and, and, and the way we're potentially stuck inside a, the tiller problem era when it comes to, you know, the work meeting and the Zoom call. But I guess it's part of the. But by definition, you you don't really know, right? You, you're sort of, you're stuck in the old paradigm, and you can't really see that yourself. Because if you could see it, you wouldn't be stuck in it. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, just for the innovators listening, I guess like I'm deeply interested in where you think the big opportunities lie, like it, where you think there's a paradigm sort of begging to be blown apart. Where you think the big opportunities lie with voice. Um. Yeah, I mean, so I think in, in terms of how we work, there is a very rich set of opportunities to completely rethink how we do collaboration. OK, so um, I'll give you a very live example that um, I tweeted about not so long ago. So I was missing li live in-person workshops. That, that's one of my you know bread and butter activities is running workshops with post-its and pens with people. And. I started to think about VR, you know, I've got, I, I live in a city where loads of VR developers live in Brighton in the UK, and, and I was starting to reach out to them and say, well, how could we start to replicate, you know, uh, workshops where, you know, we, we don't need to be together every day, but there are certain moments where we want to actively collaborate and brainstorm, and it would be nice to be able to kind of have body language and turn to each other and move things around in the physical space. And my mind immediately went to the, went into Tiller problem mode, and I started thinking, oh, how good is VR at sort of drawing doodles and Sharpies, right? And using Sharpies and Post-its. And that's exactly where my brain went to. And I, it took me a moment to go, hang on a minute. 
maybe there's a beautiful, rich, new way in which we can collaborate using VR, which is becoming much more commodified now. There are some really amazing pieces of technology like the Oculus Quest, which give you that feeling of being with somebody and are relatively accessible now. But the way in which we actually collaborate won't be a blind replication of pen and paper. And I've had a few ideas. I think there's so much to do here to figure out how we work together. I would also add that you can't entirely separate this from culture. I think, honestly, those organizations who are shifting their behaviors best are the ones with a high degree of internal trust, because those are the ones that will say, hey, I don't need to be looking over somebody's shoulder. I don't need to be talking to them constantly or replicating the same number of meetings that we used to have. That is a part that we can't ignore. It won't be the technology alone. Often these shifts come from you know grassroots efforts to change the culture or the way we organized ourselves. <clears throat> Yeah, and I, I, I mean, uh, personally, I wonder if uh, part of what will happen is we'll come to the realization that not every work meeting needs to be a video call. Some could just be an audio call, just a, just an old fashioned what we used to call telephone call. <laughs> <laughs> Probably us five are old enough to uh, <laughs> to to remember those days when you you talked about uh, you know calling someone on the phone. Um, yeah, you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, when you watch TV from the 1970s, you know, and they've kind of thrown every special effect at it that they have because they've just invented those effects and they're really proud of them and they want kind of want to use them all. It, yeah. it, it feels to me our approach to to kind of work virtual work meetings and Zoom calls might might be a bit that way that we've overcooked yeah. it and, and some <laughs> are trying to simplify it. If you take that one step further, if some things can be only audio, and you don't have to be in the same space. There's going to be a lot of, you can have a walking around conference all over Europe where people walk around and listen to audio and it's the, still the conference where you meet each other and those things yeah. happen and information is, so, you know, the space confinement is gone as well. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. I, I wanna talk for a second there about old technologies. So I think that's a really interesting point. Um, so um, at Nintendo, they had this concept of um, lateral thinking from withered technology. So the original Game Boy, actually used a really, uh, at that time, quite old uh, processor in within the Game Boy, because what they believed in Nintendo in the 80s and the late 80s was, we should may be able to make things fun and useful just from old technology, not having to rely on the cutting edge. And I really love that. And you see that a lot. Nintendo don't blindly chase kind of the very latest graphics processors to make the best graphics. They often make use of slightly older technology in novel ways, like the Wii. And so maybe, applying lateral thinking to withered technology is a really useful strategy in these times. Yeah, and Douglas Rushkoff last week talked, to, talked a bit about that along similar lines saying, you know, one of the most powerful tools recently has just been the Google Doc, um, you know, in terms of a collaboration tool, just a simple shared sheet of paper um, can, can work wonders. When it comes to voice, obviously voice is your, one of your, you know, your deep expertise. I mean, I'm fascinated by voice and kind of, where it thinks it's at and where it thinks it's going. I mean, we, you know, did we all think that someone, some people thought voice was the future of retail? Amazon are obviously all over voice. Why are they? Like, what, what's their strategy? It doesn't look like it is the future of retail, or is it? I mean, why do Amazon care so much about voice? Um, I mean, they, their strategy, if you look at what they're doing commercially, um, B2B, is that they want um, to commodify Alexa and the hardware for Alexa to be in almost anything. So the future of that stuff is you buy a TV at a regular price and you don't even realize that it has a voice assistant built into it or your toaster or your microwave even. Um, so they want what the strategy here is to be able to kind of offer you that level of control. Um, and, I, and I believe one of the original metaphors, again, um, for what they see as the home or um, what was, you know, uh, once called, um, oh, I've forgotten the words now, but, um, you know, technology that kind of fades into the background, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, is, is they actually, I think they use the metaphor of a, a sort of octopus, like it was going to reach into all the objects around you and you could control them with your voice. I think what's happening is that voice went through this incredible hype curve now, because it's turned out to be, you know, it's growing very fast, one of the fastest adopted technologies, but it turns out it's not quite as useful in so many scenarios as we thought it was. And now we're settling back into this phase of like, okay, well, it's definitely a part of my life, but it's, and this is the key thing, it's a mix of other things. 
there's so many contexts where voice isn't really the ideal way or if it's the good way to start an interaction it doesn't turn out to be the best way to finish an interaction you know so if i um if i say you know hey alexa i want to skype my mum in the living room um i then don't need to engage with voice um or for example, the, the case of choosing things is incredibly awful in voice, right? Um, when you go into a restaurant, you need a menu, or when you go up to the counter, you look at a list of things behind the counter, right? There's many, many old school, in real life ways in which our voice is not useful. So we're going through a bit of a telephase where we kind of go, well, how, how does it actually fit in? What do we really want to use it for? How do we avoid the hype? And what I've talked about a lot is the fact that it's multimodal. And I think that's one of the things that's holding voice back is that actually it doesn't yet work that seamlessly with all the objects around us and all the other stuff. Um, so uh, that's where we really need to head for. And of course, that's kind of a platform standards question, right? That's about big fundamental changes in the way that technologies fit together. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to know what the audience think about this. So if we have the chance, we can launch an audience poll and just ask the audience, is voice overhyped basically do you as an audience member think voice is overhyped yes or no you know go to the go to the chat vote in the poll do you think it is the future or do you think all that is a bit of hype um of course you know again i know some people are going to say it's somewhere in between you're not allowed to vote in between it's a yes or no answer is voice <laughs> overhyped um, in the meantime monique yes, should we, uh, here's the thing. you know we have questions from the yeah. audience i see a lot of interesting First of all, we have an audience from India, Montreal, Sao Paulo, and Hamburg today. Yay, hello. <laughs> hello there. And Karma is asking, how should we design products moving forward if we want to stay ethical? Oh, this is a really, this is the big question, right? How can we avoid dark patterns? Oh, um, so. Again, you do an hour on this one because, but tell yeah. us. Uh, so the, D Doug Rushkoff is potentially asked me this question last week. Um, Save up. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I so I, 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 um, I actually used to work with Harry Brignall, who who coined the term dark patterns, and I think um, it the only way to think about this really is to what degree can we separate the outcomes of design from capitalist capitalist systems? Right. We can't, you know, if if we don't fix the way our economics works and the way in which people are incentivized to behave, you know, an, an individual organization might make better ethical choices and we should all be trying to do that, don't get me wrong, but unless you fix the economics, there will always be actors in the system who will exploit things. And I think that is the real question. And over the course of my 20 year career, it almost always comes back to that. Okay, I think unfortunately, that's all we have time for in this segment, <clears throat> so, what are we going to do before we say goodbye? We have um, Next World's interview and we go deeper into a lot of things. So roll the credits for Next World. Okay, audience members, Ben, let me set the scene for you. Imagine this, it is the near future Amid an increasingly acute crisis on planet Earth, a daring team of technologists hatch a plan to save humanity. It is their plan to travel along with a thousand specially selected people far beyond the solar system to the planet Next One, where they will establish a permanent base, a new society, a new home for humanity. Ben Sauer, thanks to your outstanding achievements in the field of product design and general thinking and brilliance, you have been selected to be amongst those a thousand people. Before you undertake this dangerous voyage, there are five crucial questions you must answer. So let's hear question number one. Name one luxury physical object you want to take to your new home. Wow, okay. Um, so I don't know if this is really a luxury object, but it's been very useful to me recently during the crisis, which is a 3D printer. So I actually joined a group um, of 8,000 volunteers in the UK, 3D printing uh, face shields for NHS workers. So given that and given the potential new crises on our new home world, maybe I'll take one of those. I like it. That's a, yeah, brilliant. You can 3D print masks to your heart's content on next one. That is done. 
Uh, let's see question number two. Name one exceptional person who should qualify to be among the thousand people to go with you to next one. Uh, so I am a student of a conflict uh, resolution method called nonviolent communication. And I would take one of the practitioners with me to the new world to make sure that our society, um, everyone learns in that society um, how to remain peaceful and compassionate. And her name is Mickey Kashtan. She's made a big impact on my life. So thank you, Mickey. Thank you. Fascinating. And this is going to be a very fraught and dangerous voyage. So I sense there will be conflict. That could be a very useful addition to the crew. Um, right. Question number three. Create one law that bans something from Planet Next One forever. And I should say, look, there's a there's a basic system of law. Murder is banned. You know, theft is banned. What would you ban? Uh, I might ban uh, land ownership or certainly make it really hard for people to speculate on land. Uh, I live in the most unequal country in Europe. That's the UK. And the uh, negative effects of land speculation and uh, inequality are very self-evident. So, yeah. I'm with you, Ben. But when you advance that point, your conflict resolution expert is definitely going to be um, earning her money. <laughs> I, sense, I sense. OK, let's see question number four. This is a tough one. Explain one truth about human nature or one ethical principle to live by that you have learned from experience that you want to convey to the next one society. Wow, that's a really tricky one. Um, I'll try and explain this one as briefly as I can. I do not believe in free will. I think it is a, a human idea that actually doesn't mean anything. We live in a material universe. Our actions are simply based on chemical electrical reactions in our brain. And we're truly not actually responsible for anything we do. I think we're observers of our lives. However, and uh, well, I should say that allows me to forgive any act in the world, right? It's a, it's a way of sort of forgiving people's actions in the world. However, I believe that you personally do have to believe in free will because that's what gives you motivation to get up in the morning. So I believe sort of two contradictory things at once. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, we could do a whole show. We could do a whole week on that. Um, yeah, I can I can I can believe that there's no such thing as free will, but it doesn't mean I'm not annoyed with a person if they load the dishwasher wrong. So, you know, I, I, right. I know what you're saying. OK, question number five. Last week's pioneer was the author Douglas Rushkoff and Douglas wanted to ask you how do you build social and racial justice into the design process? Wow. Um, yes, I heard Doug ask that question and I, and I immediately thought that we needed to spend an entire show on just that one, which uh, didn't pan out. But um, I have been thinking about um, everything that's been going on since the Black Lives Matter crisis emerged. Um, I think my advice is mostly around self-examination. Um, and understanding what part that we have historically played in privilege. And I want to give a really personal example because I think we need to share more of these examples and make it safe to actually have non-judgmental conversations about where we've made mistakes in the past. Um, I have trained designers in India um, and we were treated with this huge amount of reverence and respect when I went over there. And it was only in the past couple of weeks that I start to ask myself questions around how I was inadvertently and unconsciously repeating kind of colonial notions of being superior in some way of how Western design is somehow better. Not that I ever consciously believed that, but I was caught up in a system that was essentially assuming that. And what I hope is that by being more aware of these things, we can actually interrupt those narratives and, uh, and promote racial justice. Thank you. Okay, question number six. So next week's pioneer is the technologist and thinker, Professor Paya Aurora, um, author of The Next Billion Users. She's all about how the internet is being used in and is going to impact the developing world. So what would you like to ask her? Well, um, I think she's spoken about this before, but I'd love her to answer this again, is around um, what are the most common false assumptions that people in the West make about technology use and culture in India uh, or extend that out to the developing world as well. I think we make a lot of assumptions. I know I have, um, and I'd love to hear more about that. 
Perfect. Thank you. We will ask Professor Pale Aurora that question for you and we'll all find out the answer. Thank you so much, Ben. Pack your luggage, get your conflict resolution person on the phone uh, <laughs> and, and board the ship because you are on your way. Um, Monique, I think we're, we're going to have to wrap up, right? We're running out of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was so much fun to have you here, Ben. It, I thought we'd invite a designer, but you're really a philosopher, right? I've, I've learned so many lessons here. Ina, thank you, Ben. Ina, can you read us out? I think we need what I, I really oh, want to hear the results of the audience poll. Exactly. Oh, I, there you I will tell you that in a we'll second. Um, and this time, it's not that close as it was in the polls we did last time. So it's 70% yes, voice is overhyped, and 30% saying no. That's a very clean, clean answer. Yeah. And okay. Yes. The indicators that are going to make it work. It's the thirty percent that believes it can work that will make it. Work. <laughs> yeah, I think it can work. Probably I not. Like their answer, though. <laughs> I think it's very useful if you don't want to touch things. Yeah. Um, so let's see where we take it. Thank you so much, Thank um, you all. Ben, for being guest on our show today. So many interesting thoughts in there. Um, hope we can have a conversation on how to design conferences in the digital space soon. But for now, I want to thank you and the audience for watching the show today. Next week, we'll be back with Payal Aurora. She, as we already heard, is a digital anthropologist and the author of the award-winning book, The Next Billion Online. So don't miss the conversation with her next week. And thanks again for your time. This show is made possible by our hosting partners, Accenture Interactive and Factor 3, and with support of the video platform provider 23 and our new media partner, T3N. Yay. Also, big thank you to the lovely people providing us with video footage for the news section and to everyone involved in planning, organizing, and producing the show today, especially to Ben, the next team, my fellow hosts, and you. See you next week. Bye. 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 See you soon.